Welcome to another episode of the Mapscaping Podcast. My name is Daniel and this is a podcast for the geospatial community. My guest on the podcast today is Alex Leith. I had the pleasure of spending time with Alex at the 2023 Phosphor G conference in Auckland. And I can honestly say he is Australian in all the best ways. When he's feeling cheeky, he refers to himself as a digital earth architect and today on the podcast we're talking broadly about cloud native geospatial. The hope of this episode is to help you understand concepts like infrastructure as code, containerization, serverless functions, event driven architecture and wrap it all up with some practical examples of what this means and and how it might work in the real world. And none of this would be possible without today's sponsor planet if you haven't heard of planet before go back through the archives and look for an episode called planet imaging everything every day almost and if you have already listened to that episode you'll remember that planet images the earth every day to create a living data set of global change and you don't need to learn a whole bunch of new tools or spend a ton of time to make use of these insights use planet satellite imagery to drive richer analysis with high spatial resolution, high frequency data, broad area coverage, and automated detection feeds integrated directly into your geospatial platform. You can learn more at planet.com slash GIS. I'll put a link to that in the show notes of this episode. Thanks very much for sponsoring this episode, Planet. Really, really appreciate your support. Hey, Alex. Welcome to the podcast. I'm really pleased that you could join me today. We met at the latest Phosphor G in Auckland. And it was fantastic ha- having hanging out with you. <laughs> and you mentioned that you do a lot of work at Cloud Native Geospatial, and I thought this would be great to have an expert on the podcast like yourself to explain Cloud Native Geospatial to myself and, and hopefully also the, the listeners. Would you mind just taking a couple of seconds just to introduce yourself, please, before we head off into the conversation? Sure thing. And thank you for having me on the podcast, Daniel. It's a, it's a privilege and an honor to be on here. All right, so I'm a geospatial professional. I've had a passion for open geospatial for quite a long time, and I found myself working with Earth observation data and in the, on a, a number of Digital Earth platforms, so Digital Earth Australia, Digital Earth Africa, and now Digital Earth Pacific. And so I've kind of started a bit cheekily and uh, calling myself a Digital Earth architect and I don't think it's a great title, but it's kind of fun. And so if I'm feeling playful, that's what I am. But my role is more around um, geospatial technology, cloud infrastructure, architecture, considerations around sort of regular IT, um, things like security and maintainability. It's almost like a, like a niche of information technology. And I feel really lucky to be in that space around big data, the digital earth, and cloud native which is what we're here to talk about thank you very much for that introduction really appreciate it let's let's start with that cloud native thing i think we should probably start with some sort of definition how how do you think about cloud native how is it different from what we had in the past yeah it's a great question and my partner actually asked me this just a week ago like what does it mean to be cloud native and i think it's important uh, to define it and it comes back to you know the origin of, of the cloud of amazon web services where like initially people started using it, like using the cloud, using it as a buzzword and really lift and shifting their current ways of working onto a a cloud platform. And over time, people start understanding that there's these as a service concepts, like a database as a service. And eventually a whole bunch of practices came out uh, just sort of like organically, I guess, out of the community where when people understood how to use the cloud better and how to use the sort of the new, the different ways of working that the cloud affords you, like thinking about things like using an object store to store data rather than thinking about spinning disks and file systems. So there's a whole whole range of concept like this. And some of them, you need to change the way you think about things. It's a paradigm shift. But once you've got that shift in your mind, it makes things much faster, much simpler, even though under the hood it's more complex. And it's much easier to get big. I kind of, I don't want to use the word, you know, scale or people say at scale because it kind of sounds like you're waving your hands around and talking rubbish, but, but that is what it enables as well. 
I think later on in the conversation, we should almost have, you know, walk through some of these sort of overarching concepts that we hear under the umbrella of, of cloud engineering or, or cloud native geospatial and walk people through that and maybe give some definitions around them and, and tell them, help people understand how they fit together. You mentioned this idea of lift and shift. So I guess I'm still stuck in this paradigm of thinking where, oh, cloud native, I'm using somebody else's server, just as an example. So I have my, my web services running on my, my local machine that I can go down and touch and point to and I think, ah, I could scale this in another way if I just take exactly what I'm doing here and push it over onto somebody else's server and then they have all the responsibility for, for the maintenance and upkeep and obviously I get a service level agreement. But that, that's kind of part of the way I think about the cloud, moving things to the cloud. But you mentioned this, as, this idea as things as a service. Could you rip apart my understanding of, of cloud native geospatial and, and help me understand how these as a services fit in there and, and the different way we need to approach this instead of just doing exactly what I'm doing on my local machine, but in the cloud. Yeah, sure. And um, I'm kind of lucky to have had this evolution in my career, I guess, in my use of IT in, in the cloud. About 10 years ago, I worked for a, a local government for Glenorchy City Council, and we wanted to deploy a public web mapping system. So we, we sought some quotes for a VPS or a virtual private server, you know, hosted by a you know, data center. We looked at a few different places. And then because I'd been exploring AWS, Amazon Web Services, at home, I'd sort of put my own credit card into my own account and launched the server and installed some software in it. And I discovered it's really easy. And you can look at the pricing and it's just there as a shopping list. Whereas if you send an email off to one of the, ma- the I guess, managed service providers in Tasmania, where I live, or even um, you know, a national Australian organization. They take a week to come back and a salesman sends you this giant incomprehensible document and the numbers, the figures in there are, are really quite large. And they'll talk about you know, security and all the reasons for the, the demilitarized zone and all of these kind of data center concepts. But with AWS, you just go into the, you know, into the shopping list and launch a server and you know exactly how much it costs per hour and, and it's there. And so I deployed a server that way, um, installed it manually using you know, SSHDN and configured some stuff and learned as I was going and got it up and running. And um, that worked fine. But later, my next job, I started learning how to do things a little differently and using something called an auto scaling group to manage those servers. And so then instead of having like a pet, a server that you name, that you care for, and that if it died, you'd be really disappointed because you'd, you'd put all this work into it. You start thinking about servers as like a goldfish, where if it dies, you just uh, put another one in the bowl and nobody notices that it's a different fish because it looks exactly the same. So an auto scaling group has like a has a recipe around what to do with a server, and then you give it the recipe. So so each server that hits that la- launches in the auto scaling group follows this recipe, and at the end it says I'm ready, and it's added to the um, the number of servers that are running. That might be zero, that might be one, that might be a hundred. And um, you put a load balancer in front of that, and then you've got something which is quite dynamic, um, secure. It's replaceable. So it's, it's got a script. It's got a recipe. Uh, it'll launch itself again. It'll sort of self-repair. And I'll probably pause here, but the next steps after this is starting to look at orchestration of those kind of servers in a more abstract way. So you, I think you mentioned one of these as a service there. So the idea that if this thing dies, another one will take its place because you've, you've come up with a standardized approach. Like I want my server, each server to look exactly like this. If that one dies, just get another one. Or if I need more, I just get another one. Yeah, that's right. And well, this is a less, less of an as a service. This is still really thinking about service, but saying rather than having the one server that I've launched that I'm going to configure that has all of the right things and I followed the steps, but maybe I didn't because I didn't read the, the um, documentation right and missed a step. You're spending time up front developing the script that you're going to launch the server with and that takes longer, but once you've got it there, you know that every time that server is launching, it's going to have exactly the same stuff installed and it's going to behave exactly as you expect it to behave. So the, I guess the, um, the back end in AWS terminology is that it's a, it is a, it's called an auto scaling group. And so that is a pool of servers, a potential service, and it could be zero, it could be 10. And you can say, I want you to scale up or scale down. You can add rules for it to do that. 
But really the point is that instead of having one server that you've manually deployed, or even if you've written a script to deploy it, you've got like a recipe to deploy servers, which you can then say, okay, I want one now. Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. We're going to get into that later on. I've got some questions around infrastructure as code, which I, I think might tie in nicely with this here. But could you give me some more relevant examples then of, of these as a service? Like I'm thinking maps, maybe a, a database a, as a service, a storage a, as a service. How does this tie in with this idea of, of scalability? I have the, a recipe for these services. Um, does it make sense they all pull on different services or do you have one master, one in the background somewhere? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and so the evolution of my, um, my sort of self-managed uh, GeoServer instance for this council was that I had installed Postgres on there. So Postgres and GeoServer and together they make a, a web mapping infrastructure. It's pretty great. Um, so we had Postgres on there. And it was running for a while, but then it started, started having some errors or performance issues. And I started looking at that and decided that I really didn't want to be a DBA. And so I looked around and realized that there's a database as a service on AWS. And so I deployed Postgres with PostGIS through RDS, Amazon's relational database as a service. And then that manages uh, backups, uh, disaster recovery, it manages scaling, uh, manages just a whole bunch of fundamentals, like minor version patches. And so then I never had a problem again with managing the boring part of that database. I could just add data to it and um, maybe tweak the data, add a spatial index or do the kind of the easy things, the, the sort of management stuff that's, that's nice and didn't have to worry about how it was storing stuff on disk that was just um, abstracted. And so that's a, that's a real example of how these as a service functions can just make your life simpler. And if you've got a, if you're sort of doing a full stack or like a broad range of tasks on your own, if you can make things simpler and manage less of the busy work, it just makes your life much easier. Like sure, I could learn how to administer a um, Postgres server, but is that going to add value to my organization? Is that going to be add value to, to myself or my future self in terms of work that I can do? Or is it better to really get a handle on using services, combining many services together in order to, to work um, smarter, not harder, you know? Yeah. When you think about this, or, and maybe you think about it differently now, but, but back then anyway, when you were doing this, when you had, oh, okay, let's just move my, my web application to the cloud, oh, let's outsource the, the database side of it. We just think about this as I have my, as two separate or, or one, one application. This is just one application. So I, I do this once, like I, I link up my geo server to my Postgres database as a service. And I just do that once. And then you don't ever have to think about scaling. As long as that's working there, it can just scale up and down a, as needs be. Or, or is there something else there that, I, that I'm missing? Look, there's, that's one of these, um, these sort of cloud concepts is, you know, the auto scaling side of things. And I actually had a conversation with a fellow quite a long time ago, um, and he said, have you got any triggers to add more service to your auto-scaling group? And does it auto-scale very much? Well, what I said was that we do have these triggers. So if it passes a threshold of amount of memory used or number of um, CPUs, CPU usage percentage, then it'll add another server to the pool. But often by the time it's added another server, it takes a few minutes to bootstrap. That load has gone away. And so my point here is that a lot of that auto scaling is important, like automatically or dynamically adjusting based on demand. But often it's you're better off sort of picking a benchmark and, and having that amount of service available. And so with a database, you might manage look at your um, regular load, look at your peak load, and just make sure that you right size that instance for that. And that's a really important term there, right sizing. So making sure the database is is small so it's cheap, but large enough to to work and handle bursts. And if your load gets really peaky, then looking at different architectures that can auto scale, like things like serverless, which are um, very, very good at scaling very fast. I think now would probably be a really great time to sort of dive into some of these uh, definitions that I hinted at before. You mentioned earlier in the conversation, this idea of scripting a, a server. So uh, you've got a recipe that works and then you write that recipe out in code. So I, I, if I need to create more of them, this is what it looks like. And I know from a pre previous conversation, you call this, and maybe a lot of other people do too, infrastructure as code. Could, could you walk me through that, please? Yeah, it's a great point. So, so in the example I gave before, it's sort of, it, this is the code that the server is running 
once it's launched in order to set itself up. But then the best practice is to write some code that says, here is the infrastructure I want to deploy. And then it deploys and sets itself up. So you've actually, so you're abstracting these things. A colleague of mine um, at Geoscience Australia used to call the manual configuration the clicky clicky. So you don't do clicky clicky. Make sure you put it into the infrastructure as code. And once you start working like that, again, like I said earlier, it slows you down at the start. You spend quite a lot of time learning a new programming language or configuration language. Something like Terraform is a um, very popular one or the um, CDK for AWS or Cloud Development Kit. And so you, you write code and that defines what you want, say a, a network, a database uh, and a server, for example, maybe DNS. And you write that out as a, as a declarative set of instructions in, as code and then use a tool to launch that. And then it doesn't work and so you fix it and so you launch it again. It doesn't work and you fix it and you launch it again. It doesn't work and you can spend a long time fiddling around with this code until it's right. And then you run it and you've got a simple, repeatable environment that you know how it's configured because it's there in the code. It's not what button did Alex click six months ago when he turned this thing on. Is it self-documenting? Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, by def- it's, yeah, it's, it's declarative. It's, it is self-documenting. I mean, it's complex and you need to understand this other abstraction of what you're deploying. And it really helps to have spent the time doing it manually because then you kind of understand what you are deploying. But yeah, it's self-documenting. And the other ad- advantage here is that you can, you can parameterize it. You can add some variables in there and then say, here's staging, and then deploy the same thing, but with this slightly different configuration, and there's production. And then you've got dev, prod, or staging and production parity. And so you know that you have more confidence that when you test something in your staging environment, it's going to work in production. And that becomes really important once you want to build reliable infrastructure. Have you run into anything that lets you do the clicky clicky at the start and then export to to code to sort of speed up the process perhaps of, of learning how to create infrastructure as code? You can do that. Now, I, I can't remember the word for it, but you certainly can get the infrastructure that you've deployed and then get that state down into Terraform again. And I, I, I'm not really confident enough to talk about whether it's a good idea or not because I haven't tried it, but you can. There are ways to do that, yeah. And can I treat this code like any other code? Not that I'm a huge software developer, but my understanding is, that, you know, if you have a code base, you could put it in a, in a Git repository as an example and then update it via Git so with version control. Yeah, that's right. So, and, the, and all the nice code paradigms like continuous integration and continuous deployment, CICD, these things become important as well once you're working with infrastructure as code. So... In a mature environment, you would have uh, your main branch, which is deployed into production. And in order to propose a change to it, you create a pull request and then you lint the code, which means you check the formatting is meeting all the code style guidelines. In Terraform, you, you run a Terraform plan, which says here is what those changes you propose are going to make to the infrastructure. So before it's actually even deployed, it says this is what we think is going to change. And then you approve those changes and merge it into your main branch, merge the pull request in, and you either have a manual or an automated step that says, all right, apply these cho- these um, changes to the infrastructure. So you've got continuous deployment. And it's a very mature way of working. And it, so if you've got a pull request process, it forces code review or, or someone else to look at these changes to your infrastructure and make sure you haven't made any mistakes or forgotten something or that that it meets the security requirements and the continuous deployment means that even ideally you can sort of say the, the production environment you can't actually edit it with the clicky clicky you have to do it through <laughs> through continuous deployment and so that means that you can be confident when you look into the git repo and have a look at the infrastructure as code it is exactly what is deployed out in production you have confidence about your environment and that helps again with with things like security reviews, you can say, do, are all of my instances security groups locked down to single IPs or whatever? Okay, so, so that is infrastructure as code. This is the recipe that we can develop on, that we can maintain and that we can deploy and that we can have a lot of confidence around. Like we're, we're getting the same thing every time. So that, you know, that, this makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's right. But we've got to come back to the clicky clicky at some stage just because it's fun to say. <laughs> 
<laughs> I have a feeling this ties into the idea of containerization, but I'm not exactly sure. Yeah. Can you tell me what that is? Yeah. So, so back to my story. So I had a job after council working for a, um, a startup called TideTech, and we organized MetOcean data, so global data products, uh, sold them to giant shipping companies and, and yachties. It was all about uh, ocean currents and wind and sea surface temperature, that kind of thing. Anyway, we organized a lot of data and served it out through GeoServer again. And the process that we used to deploy applications there was using CloudFormation, which is an AWS technology. It's a precursor to CDK. And we deployed auto-scaling groups, which ran Docker containers on them. So you'd have a, a, an instance of a certain size, and the recipe to deploy that instance would install Docker, pull the Docker container, or image, I should say, and then run the Docker container. And that's how we ran workloads, whether that was a data processing pipeline or a GeoServer or our Django web application. We would run it in a Docker container. And Docker is really nice because I talked about you know, parity between staging and production. You know, you, you, what works in staging is likely, to, is likely to work in production. They're likely to be the same. If you do your work in a Docker container, then your development environment then becomes closer to your production and staging environment. You don't want to have the old way of the IT sort of way of separating development and operations means that the devs build, write some code, they get it all ready and they throw it over the fence to operations and the operations people deploy it and say, it doesn't work here. And the devs say, well, it works for me. <laughs> it's very much harder to blame each other if they're working in the same environment, which is to say that the devs are building the containers that are deployed by the operations people, or you get to the point where you've got the development people doing operations and combine it into DevOps. Is it fair to say that a container is this very, very predictable environment? I, I can recreate it again. I know exactly what's in there. It's based off this, this script, this uh, infrastructure as code, which then can be deployed to, to Docker. That's right. So a Docker container, it has a recipe again for, it's almost like a virtual machine, but it's not. It's actually a, a fancy process, but we don't need to talk about that. Docker container comes from a Docker file, which is a recipe of start with this operating system, install some things, copy some files in there. And when someone tries to run me, run this command. That's sort of an example of it. And it's really once you're at that point and you've got a Docker image, which is the at rest version of the container, when you've got a Docker image, that environment is expected to be run as is. So it's not really a recipe to run a thing. It's like a, it's kind of like a canned environment ready to be opened up and run. And so when you deploy a Docker image, then it becomes a container and it has a bit of changes in it. But yeah, it should be disposable. And so you start thinking about things like state. And so a Docker container shouldn't be writing stuff to the file system because you should be able to throw it away and, and launch another one, just like we talked about before about Goldfish. And so if you're thinking about cloud native, you can't have state on your disk, on your file system. Otherwise, you're kind of adding uh, network file systems, which is complex. So you think about storing data in an object store, like on the network, essentially, and storing stuff in a database and getting state outside of the operation of the application. So that's probably going into a bit too much detail. The real point and advantage of these using containerization is you do have that known environment that you can come back to that you can launch once a thousand times millions of times and we've done that as part of our work in digital earth africa and digital earth australia you know we ran a data process on millions of files and we want to know that we're running exactly the same software every single time so that we're building a robust reliable known data product which makes a lot of sense so the next thing i want to move on to is something called Kubernetes. I have no idea what this is. I, I mean, I can look it up on the internet, but to be honest, it's a little bit beyond my understanding. Can you help me understand how this fits in in a potential data processing environment? Yeah, sure. And so again, my experience here was kind of organic. So at Frontier SI, we used uh, Docker Cloud, which is a service that Docker itself provides, and they had a way of managing AWS instances for you. So you could basically give it a give it a, a Docker compose file, which is a, like a configuration file for running one or more Docker containers. So you could give Docker Cloud a Docker compose file and say, I give you permission to launch instances in my AWS account. 
and it would deploy those things and it was really nice. It worked really well. They, it would automatically update um, container uh, image versions as well. So you've got your CI, CD, right? And, and for code, you, you're building your code, testing code, building code, and then you're producing Docker images as the thing that you deploy. And so this uh, Docker cloud would watch for those images to be updated. And when there was a new image, it would deploy it out into your infrastructure. So you had automated deployment, continuous delivery deployment. Docker shut down Docker cloud. And so we had to find a replacement service for orchestrating our infrastructure. And I'd heard of this thing called Kubernetes. And so I went and had a look at it. And it was created by some Google engineers who wanted a, a, a better way to run like a multitude of applications highly scalable. Essentially, Kubernetes is another abstraction and kind of the history of computing is kind of all about abstractions. You know, you go from, from hardware to software, from machine code to programming languages, and, and we've got the cloud here abstracting hardware, abstracting entire data centers, really. And then Kubernetes is kind of an abstraction layer for clouds. And so you create a Kubernetes cluster, which has some management layer and some Auto scaling groups, essentially some, some compute resource. And then you just ask it to run some resources. And that might be a web application that publishes as a service, which has an ingress, which is a way to, to get out of the cluster. Or you might just run a workload, so a, a data process. And you can run small things that are, is a container that just uses you know, a couple of hundred megabytes of memory, half a CPU. Or you might run a big container that wants... Uh, 60 CPUs and 500 gigabytes of memory. Kubernetes kind of abstracts that work that you want to run from deploying the, the servers, the virtual servers, the cloud infrastructure that you want to run it on. I think it'd be really helpful if we could tie all this together with an example. Perhaps if you could relate this back to Digital Earth Africa. So if we could start with this infrastructure as code, talk about containerization, Docker, and then Kubernetes, if if you have an example to hand, that'd be, I think that'd be really great. So yeah, Digital Earth Australia and Digital Earth Africa really introduced me to a, a very strong, mature uh, deployment of Kubernetes. And so we run Kubernetes there to, for all of our applications. So um, open web services, so the web mapping APIs, um, web apps, data processing workloads. So that might be trying to run you know, 2,000 jobs at a time, each of which takes 16 gig of memory or something like that. And so you have these, these big data pipelines running. And when you do it right, you can do, do that on spot instances, which is a word for um, kind of bidding for unused resources on the cloud. So you can, and it costs about a tenth of what it would normally cost to get what they call a reserved instance. Or you know, if, you, if you want to definitely have a server, you, you pay for a reserved instance. If you're happy for, to, to um, have an instance that might get taken away, you can pay the spot price and it's about a tenth of the price. And so we would run very large workloads on using Kubernetes, using spot instances, and process uh, extraordinary amounts of data for reasonably small costs. And it's, it's very difficult to think of how to do that kind of scale of workload now in a data center. You know, you, you think about the lead times in commissioning millions of dollars of hardware and huge teams of people to deploy all of this compute and then orchestrating on top of that stuff, an individual with some familiarity with Kubernetes and a credit card with enough money on it, you can deploy a Kubernetes cluster and run huge data processing workloads and turn it all off at the end of the month and you know, you know exactly what it costs you. So what, what's an example of some of the workloads that you're running? My guess is you had to move a lot of data. Maybe you had to transform the data along the way, clean it up perhaps and put it somewhere else. There's a few different workloads that we ran for Digital Earth Australia and Digital Earth Africa. So one of those is like creating mosaics, creating a, an annual mosaic. So what that means is if we get the Sentinel-2 data, so Sentinel-2 is an optical or a pair of optical satellites, multispectral, and we build a, a thing called the geomad or geometric median and absolute deviations. In simple terms, it's a cloud-free mosaic, but it's like a data robust cloud-free mosaic and an annual mosaic. And so for Africa, where it's a fifth of the Earth's land surface, each year there's about 400 terabytes of Sentinel-2 data captured. And so for each year of uh, Sentinel-2, going back to about 2018, 
we would create a mosaic and each one needs to process 400 terabytes of data. And we would do that over something like a thousand servers uh, using about 15 terabytes of memory and thousands and thousands of CPUs. And we can know that it cost us something like 4,000 US dollars to process a year. So we can actually go to our, um, the senior executives in the organization and say, here's the workflow we want to run. We think that for these four years, it's going to cost us $16,000. We find to run this, run it, get the results at the end. It's reliable and repeatable because we've used containers. Uh, we know the software that we're running. We've got a lot of visibility of it with the, the tooling that comes around Kubernetes. And using spot instances means we get that scale for a, for a cheap price. And, it's, um, and, and honestly, it's, like, it's quite a small team of us that we're, we're doing this kind of work. And it's pretty fantastic and empowering to be able to use these awesome tools to, to work at that scale. Yeah, I, I love it when people put some numbers around that. It makes it, you know, it, it gives you an idea that this is a big job. You know, it's okay, we're, we're far beyond just running things on my, my local server, my local laptop, yeah, right. a, a group of laptops. This is something very, very different. And it's kind of lost when people talk about scale. We're doing this at the world scale. And for me anyway, until there's numbers around it, it's really, really hard for me to understand. Yeah. It, you know, it gets lost in the sort of, you know, big data. Well, you know, everyone's got big data. So well, what are we actually talking about here? So I appreciate that. Well, even if you think about just a year of that Sentinel-2 data over Africa, you know, 400 terabytes, it's pretty challenging to be able to find that amount of storage. You can do it. You can go to Dell and get a big quote and get a giant bit of hardware and, and then you've got to manage it. So without cloud native, it's very difficult to be able to do this kind of work. And this ties back into cloud native geospatial here because we work with cloud optimized geotiffs, which you can just stream just the pixels that you want to be working on for your, your tile or your, your part of the analysis. And you don't have to download that data in order to start using it. And that's, that's the big paradigm shift. And that requires a shift in thinking, a shift in how you're framing up these data processing pipelines. You, like you don't want to be writing to your disk. You want to be doing everything in memory, streaming data off the object store. And once you do that, yeah, this, this scale of processing becomes much easier to manage. So and another thing I often hear people talk about when they talk about doing work at this kind of scale that you're talking about here is this idea of serverless functions. Can, can you explain that for me, please? Yeah, yeah. So serverless has been around for quite a long time. And it's got a, there's a time and a place for using serverless. So with these big data processing examples that I'm talking about here, each of these jobs, each of these tiles, so we divide the work of Africa up into about 4,500 tiles and do each one. And that's how we manage doing a really big process like that. Each of those tiles, the processing of each of those tiles, takes about 500 gig of memory as a maximum, as a, as a worst case. And so you can't really use serverless functions for that kind of long running work because a tile probably takes 20 minutes but that needs a lot of memory. But for smaller units of work, it's perfect. And so an example where we use it in Digital Earth Africa is that we, we store a copy of uh, Sentinel-2 and Landsat so Collection 2. So that's Landsat 5, 7, 8, and 9 and a number of other products. So we stored them in Cape Town in the AWS data center there. We need to take a copy from the source uh, over to Cape Town. And we experimented with a range of different ways of doing that, uh, you know, using a couple of workflow tools like Airflow. But we landed on serverless because we were not really doing any work. What we're doing is saying there is a scene, which is about 10 files, lots of geotiffs and some metadata. There's a scene of Landsat or Sentinel-2, and it's arrived in a bucket, uh, so an object store in Oregon, which is where USGS and Element 84 manage the Landsat and Sentinel collections, respectively. So a scene has landed there. We need to copy it from Oregon to Cape Town, and we use serverless to do that. So both of those um, sources of data would create an event, a notification to say, there's a scene here, and that goes, that goes ding, there's a scene. Uh, we would subscribe to that notification, and we'd subscribe to it with uh, a Lambda function. So Lambda is Amazon's serverless environment. And then that function would run a little bit of Python code that copies all the files, files over, checks that it's done it, makes sure that the scene's complete. And if it's done, then it creates its own notification to say, ding, there's been a scene of Sentinel-2 that's arrived in Cape Town. And then we would have a, a, a cascading set of other work that would happen after that. And so this is what we call a, a, a um, event-driven 
framework or pipeline. It's a um, it's a really robust way of making sure this these units of work that we want to chain together happen. And it's um, it proved to be a really robust way of setting up these these pipelines, these earth observation pipelines. So when we talk about these units of work, these serverless functions or, or lambda functions, how big can they get before they become unwieldy? Yeah, I, I um I haven't really ex- explored the limits of them to be honest for um some of this really fast dynamic work and so as an example the the bulk work of copying data from oregon to africa is you know million landsat scenes and millions of sentinel 2 scenes and so there's a huge amount of work that's there actually it's like sentinel 2 over africa is about 2 petabytes of data and so so when you start trying to synchronize that volume of data from one side of the world to the other, you have to do it really carefully because you make a mistake. It can be expensive or it can take a really long time or both. So, so this worked because it's quite light. It's, it's just copy from A to B that fits in the serverless realm quite well. And so if you've got something fast, serverless functions are great for it. And so some of the rendering of web applications or, or even rendering WMTS, you know, tile services for visualization, that kind of stuff is perfect for serverless because it's... Um, It's a small, well-defined unit of work that finishes quickly. But with where we worked, we got over that threshold fairly quickly. So one of the functions that we need to do when a Landsat scene arrived in Africa is to run a scene-based process. There was a couple of those that we worked. And so that is where we run something called the water observations from space algorithm. We ran that on every single scene of Landsat. And that looks at every pixel in the scene and says, runs a decision tree to say whether or not we think it's water. It adds a few other things. But basically you're saying for this Landsat scene, which pixels do you think are water? And so we want to run that immediately on every scene as it arrives in Cape Town. And that work, it's not a huge amount of work. It's um, you know, maybe 10 gig of RAM is the worst case and you know, a few minutes, four minutes or something like that is the worst case. And you probably could do it in serverless, but we did it in a in a container using um, using a Kubernetes job, and that that kind of handled that scale better. Do containers? This might be an incredibly naive question, but containers and serverless can they all fit into this like event driven way of processing data? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so serverless used to be that you would give it a package of JavaScript or um, Java or Python and say run this. But now you can actually give serverless, give Lambda a, um, a container and say, run this script at this point in the container and it will run that. And I'm not sure about the limits of container size. It used to be that you could only give them a package of a certain size. And so it was quite hard to fit you know, the GDAO library, for example, into a package so that it could run in Lambda. But now that you can run containers in Lambda, that becomes a bit easier. And I forgot the first part of the question or the second part of the question. It was about being event-driven. Does that mean these two, in my mind anyway, d- different sort of processes? We've got a serverless function, a Lambda function, and a container. Yeah. Can they talk to each other via this event-driven approach? Yeah, absolutely. So so then, yeah, the serverless functions, uh, Docker containers, all of this kind of stuff, you can tie it up together in this event-driven framework, either manually or using there's a range of different tools. Like We use Argo Workflows, and they've got an events framework for for kind of defining what an event is and, and integrating with Amazon's simple notification service, for example. We did a fairly manual process where we would create, so the simple notification service, SNS, that creates notifications. And then we had a thing called SQS, which is the simple queue service, which would listen to those notifications and put units of work on a queue. And so Lambda can either listen straight to the notifications or it can pull jobs off the queue. With uh, Kubernetes, we ran uh, another tool. I can't quite think of what it is at the moment, but it would basically scale up and down, scale workers up and down based on the size of the queue. So if you had a lot of items on the queue, it would run a whole bunch of jobs that would work off that queue. And in that way, you have uh, you know, a notification creating work on a queue and something pulling the work off the queue. And when it finishes, if you need to do work later, you create another notification which goes into another queue, which triggers more work. And so you have this, this real event driven. So if you can sort of get a picture of that, you know, you've got, you've got this sort of chain of notifications that trigger things. And the really nice outcome of that, using notifications to trigger work, is that for a, a job that's running, 
it doesn't need to know what happens next. So if we have you know, the, the process that's copying data from Oregon to Cape Town, it doesn't need to know to run the WAFs algorithm, the fractional cover algorithm, and indexing into the Open Data Cube. All it does is say, I've finished copying stuff there. That's all the work I need to do. I'll just create a no- notification that I'm done. And then we have one or more or zero or more queues that subscribe to that notification to say, I want to know when this job is done because I have an action that I want to do after that. And so you see it separates the, um, the work from the downstream work. The other nice thing is that we can create these notifications as, as public things. We're building open data platforms here. And so making them open means that if there's someone else who's building a business based on the data that's in Cape Town, they can listen to these notifications and know when there's a new scene so that they can deliver value to their customers. They don't have to build their own infrastructure. They can, they can just use the as-a-service um, notification function that, that we're already providing. So, wow, well, thanks very much. I appreciate all the examples that you've, you've given during these explanations and your sort of slow, methodical way of walking us through that. It's, it's been great. I've, I've definitely learned a ton. There'll be some people out there that are listening to this and going, this sounds ridiculously complicated. Like, uh, you know, I'm not process. I'm not trying to move all of the Landsat scenes to, to Cape Town. This is not for me. What, what would you say to those people? Like, if they, if they wanted to get started with this anyway, if they wanted to try some, some of the stuff out, if they wanted to sort of inform themselves or educate themselves, I should say, around cloud native geospatial, where, where would you say they, they start? Yeah, look, Kubernetes is ridiculously complex. There's no getting around it. It's extremely useful and it's, once you've got it set up, it is hugely empowering, but it's extremely complicated and there's a whole bunch of concepts that you need to learn and then you need to maintain that. So what I would say is that if you've got a workload that you're running on the cloud, really think about using infrastructure as code because if you can make that repeatable, then you're helping yourself. Because I don't know if there's people out there that have stuff that they've deployed on the cloud or deployed somewhere. And you come back to it six years later and you're like, holy crap, what did I do? And I never expected this to be running for this long. I just launched it and thought that's great and then went and had a beer. I've certainly got stuff that's deployed that I've created that is very difficult to reproduce. And I really wish that I'd spent the time writing it down as, as code. And an example of that is that I, um, for a job that I'm doing at the moment, so I work for myself now. So a job that I'm doing at the moment, we needed, I needed a, a bigger server to be doing some data processing on something with more memory. And I'm rather than going and clicky clicky launching an instance on AWS, I've written myself a little bit of Terraform infrastructure's code and it launches the instance. And that's great because a colleague of mine needed one too. So I essentially copy and pasted that, changed the name from uh, my name to his name and launched him a server. And it means that this work is reproducible. It's, it's simple. And if I need to do it in a year or two years' time, then I can pick up that template and do it again, and I know exactly what I've got. So when I think about getting started with, firstly, let me say thanks very much. Appreciate it. I guess, is there any place out there on the why, the World Wide Web where people can go and find some, I don't know, templates of this kind of code so they can see what's involved and, and have a, a starting point? Yeah, absolutely. So Terraform is really big. It's very widely used, and there are examples everywhere. So I. I don't know of a single specific excellent point to look at. I do have this example that I'm talking about with the single instance on my GitHub, which is um, github.com slash ospacious. In there, there's something called Terraform instance. And that is a very simple example, probably without enough documentation, that launches a single EC2 instance. So so (laughs) there's one example I can think of. I'll have to get that link off you and post it in the show notes. No worries. Let's talk to the the non-developer here for, for a second. Do you see sort of any advantage in, in just starting to use cloud native uh, file formats? I'm thinking specifically about uh, COGS. Yeah. Look, there's, it's a really big deal and a really big opportunity. And a simple example of this is around Digital Earth Africa. We had a, um, an Africa-wide, or have an Africa-wide digital elevation model, and that's stored in Cape Town. But I can add that as a URL into QGIS from here in Hobart and it will render at the Africa scale, so a huge broad area, or at zoom right into um, Kilimanjaro and have a look at the, the giant glorious mountain, and it'll render that at full resolution as well. And that's, that's only a 60 gigabyte file, but I don't have to download that in order to use that. I can just use that as a URL 
streaming the data, just the data that I need over the network. And so that's the opportunity in cloud native geospatial. And we're going to get there as well with the emergence of geoparquet with vector data. And so there are little examples there now, and mostly I've seen it working with programming language. But I used an example using Python of reading, listing, uh, counting scenes out of a geoparquet file of the Landsat and Sentinel-2 scenes over the Pacific. So these parquet files have something like 10 million rows in them, say, something like that. It's probably more than that for the Sentinel-2. So there's 10 million rows in there. And I can write some Python to say, open the file, and it lazy loads it so it doesn't download the entire file, and count all the scenes that are um, that are over the Pacific, essentially. So I fed, I fed it some path rows, which is the, lands, the footprint of the Landsat scene. So count all the rows that have this in there. So this is summarizing 10 million rows over the network, and it returned in you know, less than a minute and says, here you go, Alex, there's 400,000 of them. And that kind of work is, is nuts because you think about downloading a giant shapefile like that and starting to write some, I don't know, select statements on there. Well, that's all fine. But what about if it's 100 million rows or, or a billion rows? Being able to um, stream this data over the network just from a, um, an object store, from essentially a HTTP URL, is hugely empowering. Does this tie in with some of your thoughts around disintermediating the data? <laughs> yeah, it does. Thank you for bringing up. So that's my ridiculous um, a term of the month that I would love if it caught on. But disintermediating the data is around saying rather than having these OGC web services or, you know, the, the Esri open data portals or the whatever it is, some kind of API where you say, I need to learn this whole new API language. If we can have our applications and our code and our, you know, our desktop GIS go straight to the data without having to go through an intermediary OGC API for whatever thing, then I think things are simpler and better. And that's what COGS are, you know, cloud-optimized geotiffs. So we have you know, hundreds of thousands of COGS over, over an area. I can query a stack API to know which COGS I need to talk to or interrogate a, a GeoParquet file just straight over the network to find out which COGS I want to load and then just stream the bits out of those into memory. I don't have to learn the, um, the web coverage service. and I don't have to push work onto someone else's server in order to coordinate that data. If I can turn it into a whole bunch of requests just for the pixels I need, for the bits I need, or for the rows or columns that I need, then it's going to make the tools that I use simpler. It's going to make the code that I write simpler, and it's going to mean less other people's servers in between me and the data. So no more opinionated APIs and no more having the burden of serving that data like on the, the people that are hosting it. Well, that, not the, the burden is lessened, I guess, because there's, there's no more third-party service. Yeah, that's right. And I think it's, that's a call to action for the, um, the, those data custodians out there is to consider these cloud-native geospatial data formats, the analysis-ready cloud-optimized data formats. Because if you can release your data in that form, then people can just stream it. They can use it and you don't need to build the whole, you know, dashboard portal system. You can do that too. But if you're going to do that, there's another term, dog food. So dog food, the, the cloud native data formats. And if your tools work on those data formats, then mine do too. And if it's good enough for you, then it's good enough for your dog. It's good enough for me, you know. <laughs> Well, what else? So I agree with you. I think that this is a call to action. And I think it's, it's one more excuse that, that's off the board. Oh, it's difficult to maintain this, these services. It's, it's expensive. Well, there's always going to be a cost involved. But I think with, with the, the move towards cloud native data formats, that, that cost is considerably less than, than what it was. And it's easier to set up and it's easier to maintain. Yeah. I, I guess this, for me personally, there's still a question around yeah, if they're not going to be open, if, they, if there's going to be some sort of login, how is that going to work in a cloud native world? But I, I guess we'll get there at some stage. What else do you see going forward when we think about you know, cloud native geospatial? Honestly, I think that's where we're at. So, so we've got some fantastic champions uh, around the world. So Chris Holmes and um, Jed there at Radiant Earth, and um, they're helping define these um, data formats and they're doing a really good job of it. And those data formats essentially now cloud-optimized GeoTIFFs, ZAR for um, dense time series, and GeoParquet for um, vector data, tabular data. And something that I'm 
I guess my mission I'm giving myself is to is to really document and socialize the ways of working with these data formats. So to do more more to get this data into people's hands to say this is how you can do it and this is what it means and this is why these things are important. And so it's it's data custodians, but also data consumers, students, scientists, people running a business, building on top of these cloud native data formats is going to be a really big deal. And there's this throwaway from, I don't know how long ago, that um, when someone does a PhD, they spend 80% of their time organizing the data before they can start actually doing their science, doing their research and getting productive with the data. And if we can remove that 80% of the time and let them spend 100% of their time just using data, then that's gold. I totally agree. I think the next step, once we can do that, I think the next step is to convince them to share their work in a way that other people can understand it. Yeah. And to, to get the work out, out there. Yep. And look, code is great for that. You know, Jupyter Notebooks, I think, are a, a great way of doing your science in a way where it helps you be iterative, but then also means that you've got something which someone else can run. And again, having these cloud-native geospatial data formats, so COGS, and open APIs like the Stack API, it means that I don't need to have access to a supercomputer to a... Um, some giant government agencies' uh, data science environment to a, um, I don't know, the BI tools. I can run a notebook on my laptop that finds all of the Sentinel-2 data over Tasmania and does some analysis on it. And then I can share that with someone else and they can run it. They don't need to have access to my computer or the server that I ran. You can run it anywhere. And that's hugely empowering as well. It's funny, that idea of reproducibility, this comes up again and again in the conversation, right? We got it right at the start when we're yeah. talking about infrastructure as code yeah. and the way we you know, containerize these things because we want them to be reproducible. Yeah. And, and now right at the end, we're also talking about that the results of this are also re- re- reducible. Reproducible. <laughs> reproducible too, yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah, I did this. Go, you can go and look. You can check for yourself. The data's there. This is my code. Yeah, it's a, it's a big deal. I mean, there's reproducibility in science has been talked about, you know, combining the data with the paper but you know people shouldn't have to be organizing their data what if we're using all the same global standard open access data repositories to do our science that maybe that's a bit of a utopian fantasy but hey in some ways for like for the big um, reference earth observing satellites landsat and sentinel 2 we're we're there and it's incredible it's incredible and i think that there's still people that don't understand what this opportunity is and how long it took to get here as well. Now, that's probably another episode, Daniel, is the whole the history of analysis-ready Earth observation data because USGS only a few years ago published their Collection 2 data on AWS, on S3, all of it under an open license, all of it open access, and it's an incredible opportunity. And before three years ago, it, it did not exist. It was very difficult to get access to that quality level 2 data from the USGS. I think I'll have to get you back on the podcast at some stage, but, but let's, let's see if anyone listens to this one, okay? Or <laughs> if people listen to this, I'll, I'll consider inviting you back on. Oh, it was very kind of you. <laughs> hey, thank you very much, Alex. I, I really appreciate it. Where, where can people go? Like, they've listened to you for an hour now. Um, where can they go if they want to reach out to you, if they want to get in touch, continue the conversation, ask you more questions? Yeah, sure. So I'm on Twitter still, and I'm going to keep calling Twitter. You can find me on LinkedIn as well. Uh, but I've got a, a small company called Ozspacious. Uh, so there's a website there. You can go and visit that. I'll give you a link to put on the um, in the notes, Dan. Thanks very much. Really, really appreciate your time. Thank you very much, too. It's a privilege to be on here. It's been great. Thank you. Really hope you enjoyed that episode with Alex Leith. There'll be contact information in the show notes of, of the episode today, so please check that out. I'll also put links to other relevant podcast episodes, including the one about Planet, which is the sponsor of this episode. So if you're interested in that, go back to the, through the archives and look for an episode called Planet, Imaging Everything Every Day Almost. It's well worth a listen. And if you don't have the time to listen to that episode, you should know that Planet images the Earth every day to create a living data set of global change. And you don't need to learn a whole bunch of new tools or spend loads of time to take advantage of these insights. Use planet satellite imagery to drive richer analysis with high spatial resolution, high frequency data, broad area coverage and automated detection feeds integrated directly into your geospatial platform. But you can learn more at planet.com GIS. Thanks very much for sponsoring this episode, Planet. Really, really appreciate your support.
And that's it for me. That's it for this week's episode of the Mapscaping Podcast. If you want to reach out to me for whatever reason, you'll find contact details at mapscaping.com. And I'll be back again soon. I hope that you'll take the time to join me then.